without man's interference, some things never change. It probably looked much like this to the early settlers who came from Van Diemen's land in 1835 in search of new pastures, more land for grazing their sheep and cattle. These waters offered them their first passage into the land that became the colony of Port Phillip. This ancient river valley held many secrets, many treasures that only slowly revealed themselves to the new inhabitants. For most of Melbourne's population, the Maribyrnong River Valley remains an undiscovered treasure. upstream from its confluence with the Yarra River, the Maribyrnong winds through the urban reaches of Footscray. Essendon. Sunshine. And Keelor. It's a tidal river as far as Avondale Heights, some 16 kilometers from Port Phillip Bay. It's navigable by small craft for most of this distance. Beyond Essendon, the river is deeply set into a valley below the basalt plains that stretch westward from Melbourne. The walls of the valley tell of the violent volcanic action that formed the area, of the plant and animal life of another age, of the original people who made the valley their home. 150 years of European settlement have brought many changes to the river and its surroundings. Changes more dramatic than any in the previous 40,000 years of human occupation in the valley. The river and valley are well hidden. Even though the river is bridged by many main thoroughfares, there are few stretches of road that actually follow its banks. called a highway, travellers pass within a hundred metres of the gorge, often unaware of the splendour below. Access to the river is mainly through roadside reserves, larger parkland developments, walking tracks and cycling tracks. The catchment area lies to the northwest of Melbourne, as far as the Great Dividing Range, across a vast basalt plain from Bullingarook to Kilmore. The two main tributaries are Deep Creek and Jackson's Creek. Deep Creek begins its journey in the northern foothills of Mount Mazinon. Jackson's Creek rises in the gullies and foothills on the other side of the range. Pioneers quickly recognized the opportunities offered by the valley. As far upstream as Sunbury, Jackson's Creek runs beside some of the earliest and most famous settlements in the colony. Emu Bottom was the homestead of George Evans, a successful squatter. Rupert's Wood, now a secondary and agricultural college, was the home of the Clark family and a social center of Melbourne society for many years. 
wineries were flourishing in the area well before the turn of the century. Right down to the ports, there are significant monuments to early colonial activity. Today, rural residential development fringes the upper valleys. Towards Keelor, suburban residential development and industry borders the valley in most parts. Though often unseen from river level, the effect on the valley environment is significant. In the valley itself, market gardens are still in full production. Downstream from Avondale Heights, the river is surrounded by dense urban development, a mixture of housing, government establishments, parkland, and industry. The river's journey ends amid the industrial sprawl which marks its course through Footscray and Yarraville. Until 1906, the river was usually called the Saltwater River. Its story is an important chapter in the history of the colony. A story of the prosperity, the hardship, the concern, and the indifference of pioneers settling in a new place. It was crossed by nearly every digger on the way to the gold fields. It was the site of the first market gardens and the first irrigation system in Victoria. Industrial development along its banks was entirely a matter of convenience. The factory stretched as far as the river could be navigated by commercial shipping. It witnessed the birth of unique industries, built on the abundant supplies of lamb and beef from the vast rural holdings that covered the western plains, such as the meat canning and meat freezing industries. Chains of industry developed, the slaughterhouses providing the raw materials for the meatworks, tallow works, candle works and tanneries. As a result, its lower reaches were subjected to the wastes and abuse of every noxious industry that could see its value for transport or drainage. As it carried the saleable products downstream, it was poisoned by the wastes. With the additional burden of street drainage and household sewerage, the river was in the throes of a slow death before the end of the 19th century. The Maribyrnong suffered the distinct disadvantage of being sufficiently remote from the main urban settlement of Melbourne to be regarded as the backyard. It was invisible to most of the population and was treated accordingly. An experience that many would claim is true for the western suburbs today. The industrialists who built their factories here and their workers had little choice but to live nearby. But until recently, even the western suburban residents themselves usually put the river at the back door. The natural balance of vegetation on the western plains was swiftly upset by the rapid expansion of grazing. The original vegetation had all but disappeared before the turn of the century. The valley was one of the few places where pockets of indigenous vegetation survived. In parts, the valley suffered as badly as the plains. Hard-fought battles in some areas have relieved it of the plague of introduced plants, brought here perhaps 150 years ago. Thistles and box thorns once carpeted and choked these slopes, which lead to the famous rock formations of the Organ Pipes Park. Where the original vegetation has survived, the valley plays host to precious wildlife.
The delicate ecological balance was often upset by the innocent acts of homesick pioneers who didn't predict the consequences of introducing the thistle, the boxthorn, and exotic pastures, or the starling, and the rabbit. The valley still suffers from similar thoughtlessness. Bluestone has always been a key feature in the story of the Maribyrnong. As many ships returned to England with small cargoes, ballast had to be taken aboard to set the ships lower in the water. The Bluestone was close at hand. Much of it ended up paving the streets of London. Quarries have been part of the valley landscape ever since. The geology of the valley has had a significant effect on the architecture of Melbourne, especially the western region. But quarrying has left more than holes. It has often made a needless mess, almost impossible to clean up. The demand for bluestone, river soil, clays and kaolin has left deep scars on the face of the valley. When the quarrying finishes, the tipping begins, with little thought for the visual impact or the possible environmental consequence. These substantial bluestone walls surrounded the powder magazine, built in 1875 to house imported mining explosives. The ammunition factory developed around it. The explosives and ordnance factories were built further up the river, all contributing to the hive of industry in the valley during wartime, with nearly 9,000 workers employed during World War II. Originally, the factories were well isolated from the majority of Melbourne's population. The growth of the western suburbs has changed all that. But the Maribyrnong's activities have never been limited to the mundane. As the tall ships lay at anchor, midstream was alive with rowers. It became a water playground for the young and old. It once provided the best fishing in the colony. It literally teemed with brim and mullet. It was a fisherman's paradise, a boatman's delight. Enthusiastic naturalists made a day's trek to view the rock formations, now part of the Organ Pipes State Park. Ferries took sightseers on scenic cruises, often stopping at the Wine Cave, a popular spot where refreshments including local wines were served, or at the tea gardens further upstream, where a variety of entertainments was available. The Maribyrnong River Parade has assisted in revitalizing people's appreciation of the river. The river is and always has been something of a paradox. Early in the century, the irony of its situation was well established. Around the corner from some of the most noxious industries in the colony lay the Flemington Racecourse with the Footscray Gardens on the opposite side of the river complementing the genteel impression. In 1906, when the river was officially renamed the Maribyrnong, the Essendon River League began a beautification program of the banks and surroundings, while downstream, the sail yards and abattoirs were well established on the banks. The river valley has been the scene of contrast and the subject of conflict since European settlement began. It's been valued for its fertility, yet robbed of its natural flora and fauna. It's been acclaimed for its beauty, yet used like a drain. It's been the subject of beautification and preservation, while being polluted and degraded somewhere up or down the river at the same time. The care has not always outweighed the carelessness. Conflicting attitudes are still clearly evident today, Within view of the most important archaeological site in the valley, the Keelor Man Dig. 
the contradictions in use and attitude are quite obvious. But the river is a force to be reckoned with. Seasonal changes made early crossings chancy, to say the least. Punts were at best precarious things, and fords became impassable in winter. Proper bridges quickly became a priority if the colony was to develop and extend. Even today, the river and its valleys test engineering skills. The floodings that over millions of years helped set the river deep into the valley severely affected low-lying settlements as recently as 1974. But the river is, for the most part, passive, and increasingly vulnerable to thoughtless acts. Poor land management allows tons of soil to be washed into the river in times of heavy rain. Erosion in the valley has scarred the land and choked the river. The ultimate destiny of the river valley also depends on the policies and actions of a number of government bodies and their response to community input. Important developments have already begun. Organ Pipe State Park, under the management of the Department of Conservation, Forests and Lands, is the result of a mammoth effort by dedicated community volunteers and the National Park Service to eradicate exotic plants, reintroduce indigenous species, and so return the area to its original state. The Board of Works created Brimbank Park from an early farming settlement on the bend at Keylor, and has retained the riverbanks in a natural state. The site of the Riverview Tea Gardens at Canning Street has been cleared and landscaped as part of a larger project involving the Board of Works and the City of Keelor. The City of Sunshine is also making progress with the revegetation of the valley slopes. Another Board of Works project is at the old Humes Pipeworks site below High Point Shopping Centre. It is now a public park where buildings of one of the first industries on the river, the Melbourne Meat Preserving Works, are retained for posterity. The adjacent fenced land, government owned, has been declared land for wildlife and is a haven for birds. This riverscape is a reminder of a bygone era. It's the site of the Henley on Maribyrnong, first held in 1912 in front of 20,000 spectators. It's a river promenade created by a local community as a special place. The way then to beautify the river was to formalize it. It remains as a particularly European and colonial view of a neat and tidy piece of river. It was created, of course, at the expense of the natural banks, the river gums, and other native vegetation, and thus the native fauna that depended on it. As an historical part of the landscape, it will probably be preserved, but it should not be repeated. Similar so-called tidying up is still happening today, such as the beaching of river banks at the expense of natural vegetation and the wildlife that depends on it. The river valley should become again a natural corridor for wildlife. But with so many government authorities connected and concerned with the river, developing a common philosophy is a difficult task. The priorities of one body are not necessarily the priorities of another. Instrumentalities who deal with the valley need to treat it with care, viewing it as a total integrated resource not from within the restrictions of geographic or governmental boundaries. While the water quality has improved dramatically in recent years, only constant vigilance will protect its future. The industrial threat is obvious. Chemical companies, oil companies, and other industries. But the threat further upstream is just as great. Erosion, fertilizers, poison sprays, and the leakage of noxious substances from tips on the perimeter of the valley. An 
and simple vandalism, from household rubbish to car bodies. Land management is the responsibility of even the smallest landowner. So what does the future hold in store for this natural treasure? It took bicentennial funding to produce the sort of cleanup required in some sections and the development of the Hume site. As the valley and its environment is restored and preserved, as more improvements are made and use by the general public increases, it is essential that people are confronted with the responsibility which accompanies their enjoyment of this magnificent resource. Whether you're walking, fishing, picnicking or boating, your presence in the valley places an obligation of care on you. If we are to be the caretakers for the benefit of future generations, we need to make them aware of the precious and vulnerable nature of the valley and show by example how we value it. The fish and wildlife are returning, as are the fishermen. More wildlife will return, but pets and feral animals take their toll. Re-establishment of indigenous species of plants is underway, but the continuing problem of weed control is with us for a long time yet. Those places where original remnant vegetation survives should be recognized and treated for what they are, part of our heritage, a living museum. As more people use the valley for recreation and residential development continues to crowd its perimeter, the message is clear. Make each move thoughtfully. Or the very reason for being here or living here will disappear before your eyes. The river will live if we protect and give life to the valley.